I love that. That's one of the beautiful arrangements of a, of a wonderful old hymn, If Thou But Suffer God to Guide Thee. I don't know whether you were watching carefully or not, but <laughs> there was a point in that where uh, Christy could not uh, turn loose from the keyboard, and she, uh, she had to have the top page removed so that she could continue, and without missing a beat, Tanner there, as he conducted the choir, uh, absolutely, in absolute time, he reached around and took that top sheet and pulled it off and laid it aside and continued with the whole thing. It reminded me of a story I heard some years ago where there was a choir that was marching into the church, and in the middle of the center aisle, there was a grate, and there was a, a grate an air grate and there was a woman who was wearing spiked heel shoes, a woman in the choir. And as they were walking down the aisle, keeping perfect time with everything, the woman's shoe got stuck in the grate and without missing a beat, she pulled her foot right out of that shoe and just kept right on, not a beat missed. And the gentleman behind her in perfect time reached down and picked up the shoe and held it in his hand, but unfortunately the grate came with him. And without, without missing a beat, the gentleman behind him fell right through the hole. <laughs> but everything was done in perfect time as you would with a, with, a, with, a good, with a good choir. Now listen, you have to give me permission a little bit. I work very hard not to hurt people's feelings uh, about uh, political matters, but I came across a quote from our president, and I'm not talking about the president today, and I'm not talking about the politics, but actually he has found a secret, and I wanted to share it to you. It's something that may come in handy for you. Uh, Billy Bush has, uh, interviewed uh, uh, the president many times back when he was the star of a TV show and there was uh, one time when he was interviewing uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Trump, Mr. Trump. Uh, Billy Bush, by the way, is, uh, is the President Bush's nephew. He was interviewing Mr. Trump. Mr. Trump was saying that his TV show, The Apprentice, was uh, number one. In, in, all, in all categories, and Billy said, now, now, now Donald, you know that actually your show has not been number one for four or five years. And, uh, uh, and, and Donald said, oh, 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 yes, yes, you just look at, you just look at last Thursday, uh, absolutely uh, number one in the uh, category 18 to, to 49, always uh, number one. And, he said, well, I'm not, I'm not familiar with that figure. And after they had got finished taping and the camera was off, uh, uh, Mr. Trump said, now, Billy, let me tell you something. Uh, if you say it, people will believe it, whatever it is. If you're a person of prominence and you say it, everybody will believe it. And Billy Bush said he took that to heart. And Access Hollywood had always been number two in the ratings of that kind of entertainment show. He said, but after he got that exceptional advice from uh, Mr. Trump, he said, Access Hollywood was always number one after that. So those of you who are turning in uh, out in computer land to St. Matthew United Methodist Church, welcome to the largest United Methodist Church in Fort Worth. <laughs> in fact, it is the largest United Methodist Church west of the Mississippi. And there's only one east of the Mississippi that's anywhere close to our size. If you show up at church and see that there are not as many people here as you expected, it's because a large number of our members are invisible. You just can't see them, but they're here. So to the thousands of people gathered here, we greet you today. And to the millions who watch us out in computer land, we, we greet you also. Now we have established our reputation. What I want to talk to you today is about the fact that we don't want to do this with our theology. You can play with it with other things in life, but with our theology, we want to seek the truth. We want to be diligent searchers for the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. My belief is that if we seek the truth in our understanding of God, we will arrive at Jesus Christ and his gospel. Because it is the truth. And one of the things that 
one of the things that we don't tend to worry about in our search for the truth is the word that is the name of the sermon today. Consistency. Consistency. Uh, <laughs> there's the old line, consistency is the hobgoblin of small minds. Is that, is, that, is that the way it goes? Well, when it comes to theology, when it comes to reading the Bible, consistency is absolutely essential. And we're not always consistent. I was talking to people Thursday night about the experiences in this book that I have written. It's not quite a book yet because it's not published. There are about a hundred experiences in this book, Discovering God. We're, we are, by the way, having a wonderful time on Thursday evenings and you're invited to join us, 6.30. If, if those experiences do not agree with one another. Is this working? Is it working? Okay. Uh, if those experiences do not agree with one another, there's a serious problem in consistency. All of those 100 experiences must agree about the nature of God and the way God works. Otherwise, the premise of the book does not work, which is that we may know the reality of God and the nature of God through experience. Our experience of God does not lie to us. And one way we know it doesn't lie to us is because they are consistent. They all give the same image of God. Consistency is essential. Now, I would read the scripture today out of the Bible, but I put the wrong number in the book and I don't have time to look it up. It's just a brief scripture, though, that I can quote to you fairly well. Our Lord told us you cannot serve two masters. Masters. You cannot have two lords. He said you're either going to love the one and hate the other or cleave to the one and let the other one go. You cannot have two masters at the same time. We cannot actually, although we think we can, we can't hold two disparate ideas, two conflicting ideas in our mind at the same time. Although Christians tend to try to do just that. Let me read you a word of scripture. Here it comes from Deuteronomy. 11, 13. If you will only heed God's every commandment, we hear in Deuteronomy from the Old Testament. If you will only heed and follow God's every commandment, then God will give you rain for your land in its season. The implication is, if you do not heed God's commandments, you're going to face a drought. The further implication is that if you do the right things, God is going to love you and be good for you. But if you do not do the right things, God will cut you off in some way. Now that's the implication of the scripture. Now we say, well, that's in the Bible. Uh, we know that's got to be true. It is in the Bible. But Jesus specifically lifted that scripture up to say something exactly opposite from that. That scripture says, if you, if you do right, God will send you rain for your fields in due season. Jesus said, God sends the sunshine and the rain equally on the just and on the unjust. Now, I thought about that line yesterday because as my sister and I went out to eat last night, it was raining. And I thought about the line, God sends the rain on the just and on the unjust. And the old joke says, yes, but the unjust have umbrellas. We, we must have been among the just because we didn't have umbrellas. 
But here rain is not seen as a bad thing, it's a good thing. What our Lord is saying is that God's love is unconditional. He doesn't change his love for us just because we are not what we ought to be. That's important for us to know. How many times have we gone to God in prayer and we have this feeling that I'm not quite right? How can I pray to God? That feeling is ours. That's not God's. There's nothing in the world that keeps us from belonging to God. I said in the sermon last week when we were talking about hell, one of the things that we're going to have to adjust if we have a consistent theology is we're going to have to have a different understanding from hell from what we may have been told by a preacher, Joe, whoever, uh, while we, when we were growing up. That there are people who suffer eternally in the flames of hell and they're there because God wants to punish them for their sins and they've made the wrong choices. Now, I'm not denying the reality of hell, okay? We know there is one because Jesus said there's one and there are people who die and have that experience. What we do have to adjust is first of all the understanding that God punishes anybody because Jesus tells us quite specifically that God is not in the punishment business. He tells us in scripture that's right around that one that I read to you. That God, that God is not in the retribution business, okay? So it's not for punishment. And I think if you read the scripture carefully and if you look at experiences, you're going to find out that that same saving work that, that is done in this world is also done in the midst of hell. That nobody can be anywhere where God is not. So this is an adjustment in our theology. If we're going to be consistent with what Jesus taught us, we're going to have to see hell as a, as a warehouse for souls who are not ready for heaven. We cannot see it as a place where people suffer eternally. If we live and move and have our being within the life of God, then God always suffers whatever we suffer. And if we're in the midst of hell, then God is suffering that with us. And God is also redeeming. And God is seeking to save. And we still have that free will and we can decide. And we can be there for aeons and aeons. Or if we're there for five minutes, it's going to feel like eternity because we are beyond time. It's going to feel like we're there forever. But we're going to have to adjust our understanding of hell. I have a pet peeve when it comes to reading the Bible. I hate to mention it to you because I hate to see people just really get mad at the preacher. But I don't know. I've had enough people mad at me that I'm, I'm getting used to it. Okay? I'm almost used to it at 85. Uh, at 75, by the time I get to be 80, I'll be completely used to it. And you won't want to show up at all. Because there's no telling what I'll say. I might just end up telling the truth. I have a pet peeve when it comes to reading the Old Testament. I find if, uh, if, there's any, if you ask people, name some scripture in the Old Testament that you just love, <laughs> they're probably going to say the story of Noah and the flood. Yes, indeed. And there's that fellow up in, I don't know, Indiana or somewhere who so loves the story of Noah and the flood that he has built a replica of the ark as it is described in the uh, in the. Uh, in the scriptures. Uh, it's a replica of the ark, but it's, it's not on water. I don't know whether the baby would float or not, but it's in the center of a biblical theme park and you can go visit it. And not only does he have two of, uh, well, he doesn't have two of every animal because there are millions of them, but he, he has two of every one of the biggest ones, okay, and then some of the small ones. He also has a couple of dinosaurs on there because in his understanding of the faith, the world is only 6,000 years old, which means that dinosaurs had to live within the last 6,000 years and be on the earth at the same time humans were here. Now, here, here's, a, here's an understanding of, of, of the world and of God, which is absolutely nonsensical because it is not consistent. It's not consistent with what we know to be true. And the gospel is consistent with what we know to be true. Okay. So he is taking this story very literally. It is one of the great stories of humankind. But the theology of the flood story, we can read it as a parable and that's fine. But if the theology of the flood story taken as history says that God got so upset with his creation. You think God didn't know what we were going to do when we got here? Do you, you, don't, you don't think he understood what we would be? What is he, is he mentally lame in some way? 
that God was suddenly so upset and so angry with the creation, he decided to destroy all of creation at one time, just wiped them out. The only problem with that is that is not the God that we meet in Jesus Christ. Now, it's, it's useful as a parable. It's useful as a warning. Straighten up, you know. Those people were just eating and drinking, and then the flood came. That's the way life is. That's the way life is. But that's not the way God is. That's the way life is. And it's a great picture of life, but it's not the way God is. Now, I said in the sermon last week that God, all that God does is done in love. Now, now think about that idea. That's just another statement of a scriptural truth. God is love. From a lot of people, you're going to have that statement, God is love, but. No, there's no but on the end of it. It's not there. God is love. What difference is it going to make in our understanding of life if we know that all that God does for us is going to be done in love? You say, well, those poor people that were destroyed by the flood, they, the, the God didn't seem to love them at all. That's where you're going to have to let something go. You can't serve two masters. You're not always going to be able to be a child of the Old Testament and a child of the New Testament. If there wasn't, if the Old Testament had told us all that we needed to know about God, there would not be a New Testament. We read it every time we have communion, we say these words, where Jesus breaks the bread and gives it to them, this sacrifice. He says, this is my body. This is the New Testament. This is the New Covenant founded on a new understanding of God's unconditional love for us. Consider that line from the cross. This is the way God deals with sin. This is the way God deals with the most difficult of sins. What worse sin could you have than to be one of the people who beats Jesus nearly to death? What worse sin could you have than to be one of those soldiers who drives the nails in his hands and in his feet? What worse sin could you be, could you have than to be one of those people who shouted out, crucify him, crucify him? And what does he say about all of those people? He's hanging on the cross. He is dying in pain for you and for me. And he says these words, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Talk about consistency. This is consistent with everything that he taught us about God. Now, now what I'm asking all of us to do is to take that essential statement, God is love, and make sure all of the things that you believe about God will fit underneath that statement. That is the umbrella for our theology, for our understanding of God. We begin with that understanding. God is love. If you have anything in your belief system which says that God is sometimes unloving, sometimes unkind, sometimes ungracious, sometimes doesn't care about you and me, that's got to go. Not just because it's inconsistent, but because it's wrong, wrong about God. The God that we know in Jesus Christ seems too good to be true. The gospel that we know through Jesus Christ seems too good to be true. But what I proclaim to you and what our Lord proclaimed is that it is true. We are loved this much. Next Sunday, we will follow our Lord to the cross during our Palm Sunday service. 
on Holy Thursday at about the time earlier actually but a same evening that our Lord gathered with his disciples for that first communion service we will gather here for communion and on Good Friday at the very time close to the very time indeed that our Lord was placed in the tomb at sundown we will begin our Good Friday service I hope that you will follow us on this journey because listen this God who loves us with this kind of love who's gone to this kind of trouble to reach us and to teach us this God is actively is actively seeking to work in your life and in mine and he asks us to get rid of every distraction and to concentrate on him because there is in this world only one complete and clear image of what God is like. Can you hear me? Jesus said, when you have seen me, you have seen the Father. If Jesus wouldn't do it, God wouldn't do it either. Consistency. Consistent. All that we know of God through Jesus Christ is one story. Join me in prayer. Dear God of grace and glory, prepare our hearts for Easter. Prepare us by reminding us that we belong to you. Prepare us by leading us closer to the cross. Prepare us by teaching us how to bend the knee and confess with our tongue that Jesus Christ is Lord of our lives. Jesus Christ is Lord of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This is our time of giving and thanksgiving for what Christ Jesus, our blessed Lord, has given to us. Please place in the offering plate your sign-in slips for today. If there's anyone who wishes to join this church who is not a member, there's a place on there for you to indicate that. And also place your lily requests in the offering plate today. We remind you of the service today at 2 o'clock for this person that we loved deeply and who was such a joy to us, Rebecca Sue Brower. May the Lord be with us when we gather again at 2 o'clock. Amen.